my name is Annie and welcome back to my channel. In the beginning of the 12th century, Arthur's presence in literature was sparse, his name only being mentioned sometimes and his legend being present in fragments. But everything changed in the 12th century. This century saw some of the most influential Arthurian works being written, and works that would change medieval literature forever. The stories written started expanding from just focusing on the figure of King Arthur himself, but to his other knights and his adventures. So the realm of King Arthur starts to move away from just the historical realm to a place where other adventures could be written, and this universe where characters could have their own spin-off stories, and this we really see growing in the 13th and 14th centuries, but it really started with this 12th century and with one particular author, but we'll get to that in a bit. For now, let's start with the author who really reintroduced Arthur to a huge audience and really marked Arthur as a historical king, and that is Geoffrey of Monmouth. A secular clerk and a master at Oxford, Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote three Arthurian works, The History of the Kings of Britain, The Prophecies of Merlin, and The Life of Merlin. And all three were very influential, but we're gonna focus on the history of the Kings of Britain today. It was likely written around 1135, and it was at the request of the new Norman kings of England who wanted to know more about the prehistory of the country that they were now ruling. And by prehistory, they likely meant before St. Augustine. So Geoffrey said that he wrote the story based on an old Britain book that he found. And we don't know if this is actually true or if he was just making it up, but his story does have a lot of similarities with the Historia Britannum, which if you want to know more about, you can see my other video on the origins of King Arthur. But Geoffrey starts his story with Brutus coming into Britain and settling the place as a Trojan refugee. And Geoffrey places Uther Pendragon and Arthur as kings right after Vortigen and before the invasion of the Saxons and when the Saxons took over the country. So even though this is a history, there are lots of elements of the legend in Geoffrey's work and the first of which we'll discuss is the presence of our beloved sorcerer Merlin. So in this work we already see Merlin working as this prophet slash supernatural being. And another episode that is later taken by other authors of the Arthurian legend is Arthur's conception. So in this story Uther is enamored by Igraine, who is the wife of Gorlois, but because she's married he can't be with her. He starts this whole fight with Gorlois, but Merlin offers a way for Uther to be with Igraine and he transforms Uther into Gorlois physically so that he can sneak into the castle while the king is away fighting Uther's armies and spend the night with the grain. And this plan works and Arthur is conceived that night. After that, the next morning, Egraine gets the news that her husband was killed in the battlefield and she realizes that the man she spent the night with wasn't her husband. And Uther comes forth and Egraine marries him. So Arthur has this origin where he is almost a bastard, but he is not, and his conception is done through the powers of Merlin. Arthur comes to power at the age of 15 after Uther dies of disease, and he is described as a very generous king who is beloved by all his people, but he is also a very skilled king when it comes to battles, and he conquers a lot of territories. He defeats the Saxons that are in Britain, and then he expands his kingdom, and he even takes Rome at some point because he didn't want to pay taxes to the emperor of Rome. Another aspect of Geoffrey's Arthur that we must talk about is how he portrays Arthur's death. After coming back from conquering Rome, Arthur finds that his nephew Mordred has been living in an adulterous relationship with Guinevere and he has amassed an army against him. So Arthur has to fight his own nephew to get his kingdom back. And he does, he manages to defeat Mordred, but he is mortally wounded in the process. But Geoffrey of Monmouth also says that even though Arthur was 
mortally wounded, he was carried away to Avalon for his wounds to be healed or tended to, also depending on how you translate. So even though we get this description that he is mortally wounded and he won't recover, we also get that element of ambiguity in which he says that his wounds were taken to be healed in this place called Avalon. So even though this is very subtle, this is the beginning of the idea that Arthur did not die and that he was taken to a magical place to be healed. And I'm sure if you know the Arthurian legend, you know of this idea that Arthur will one day return. And even though it's not specifically said in Geoffrey's text that he will return, there is this little door left open with this ambiguity that was later picked up by other authors and expanded. So Geoffrey's work plays Arthur among other historical kings of Britain made him an amazing conqueror, someone who was beloved by his fellow knights, and set up this place for other adventures to take place, all the while portraying Arthur as this figure of the Britain resistance against the Saxons. While Geoffrey's work was very popular, it was still in Latin, and so not accessible to a lot of people. But in 1155, Wace translated Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain into the Romance of the Brute, and he dedicated this to Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, who happens to be my favorite medieval queen. By writing in French, Wace made this work a lot more accessible, but not only did he write in the vernacular, he also wrote it in couplets, which made the work flow a lot less like a history and more like a story. Not only that, but he also embellished the text a little bit, focusing more on love and relationship between knights, something that Geoffrey did not do. For example, when Queen Guinevere is introduced, he describes her beauty and he claims that Arthur was very much in love with her. While he embellished a lot of Geoffrey's work, it was still taken as a history, so he didn't take a lot of liberty story-wise, but his embellishing already took a step further into making it a bit more like the romances we see in later literature. And Wace does something very interesting, as he describes all the knights as equal. He says that they, were, they all had the same honor and they were all equally brave. And for the first time in Arthurian literature, we see the round table that was built as a place for all the knights of King Arthur's court to be seen as equals and to converse as equals. By having all the knights be portrayed as equally honorable and brave, Wace also op opens up the possibilities for these knights to have adventures of their own, something which was very much picked up by other romance authors later on in the centuries. And fun fact, I actually worked with a manuscript of the Brute Chronicle. I transcribed the bit about King Arthur and his conception, so a little fun fact about that text. With Geoffrey's history and Wace's Brute setting the stage, now we come to an author who took the next step and wrote five Arthurian romances that really changed a lot of literature and this is Chrétien de Troyes. His texts are no longer super preoccupied with historical accuracy, so he takes lots of liberties and tells different stories about different knights and their adventures during the period of peace in King Arthur's kingdom. Not only are these romances important because they explored themes of chivalry and courtly love, but they also introduce the structure of romance in which many adventures happen. So it's not just one single adventure, but is a sequence of different adventures that a knight has. Structurally and in a matter of themes, Chrétien's work influenced a lot of medieval literature. I can't say that enough. These romances were likely written around 1170 or 1180, sometime in that period, and we don't know a lot about Chrétien, but we do know that he likely wrote under the patronage of Marie de Champagne, as his prologues sometimes have dedications to the Lady of Champagne. Instead of having Arthur as the main figure, these romances have Arthur as a more of a passive figure, who is just there in his court. But the active agents of these stories are the knights. So we have Sir Lancelot become a very important figure, Yvain, Gwen, Percival, all these famous knights are the centers of these stories. It's their adventures and their quests for honor and love that really are the centers. So 
the Arthurian universe really starts being created as each story focuses on a different character. And this is what I call the Arthurian expanded universe, which is a place where authors can just write about a single character having adventures and the Arthurian court and his rule are just the backdrop and the setting for the stories. Although all his works are very influential and very important, today I'm going to focus on one particular one, and that is Yvain, or The Night with the Lion. And that is because it really has that romance structure very clearly, and it portrays the knight errant. And it also really addresses the theme of chivalry versus love and personal wishes versus public responsibilities. Chrétien starts this romance by saying that true love and courtly love was lost. That was a thing of the past. And today love is just something shallow. So he's mourning the loss of true love. And then he also says that the most important thing that a man could have is his honor. So at the very start of the romance, we already have these two huge themes being set up as the two most important things someone needs to have. And that is true love, courtly love, something that is shown through actions and services and honor, his worshipfulness. And that can be achieved by doing courageous deeds and seeking adventure. After this little prologue, the king is having a feast, but he is quite tired and he goes to take a nap. As I said, Arthur takes a very passive role in these romances and his knights are talking and exchanging stories. Then Sir Kellogrenant says that years ago he was seeking adventures in the wild and he comes across this spring. And in this spring he finds a knight and he challenges this knight and they fight, but Sir Kellogrenant loses and the knight leaves him there without chance to get a word in. Yvain, hearing the story, is outraged that his fellow knight had to go through this and swears he will avenge him. So Yvain finds the knight at the spring and they fight a very brutal fight. If you like very descriptive battle scenes, Christian is the place to go. The knight eventually runs away as Yvain is beating him and he gets to a castle. But then Yvain stumps on the door and the door falls and wounds the knight mortally. And Yvain is then trapped in his castle and he doesn't know what to do until a lady comes and whispers to him and says, you just killed the lord of this castle. The lady is gonna have you executed. But the lady, Lunette, says that once a very long time ago, she went to King Arthur's court and Yvain was a knight that was very courteous to her and very honorable. So she says she will help him. Lunette then gives Yvain a magic ring that will make him invisible. <laughs> and through this ring of invisibility, she hides Yvain until she can convince her lady that the knight who killed her husband is a much more honorable man than he is and she should marry him. And so through Lunette's wisdom, Yvain ends up marrying this lady, but Chrétien does not end his romance there. Gawain shows up and tells Yvain that he shouldn't just stop being an honorable knight just because he got married. He shouldn't sit at home. And he encourages him to go and seek adventures. And Yvain does so, but he first promises his wife that in a year he will be back. And a lot of other things happen in this romance. I would highly recommend reading it. It's an amazing romance. So we really get the conflict in this romance between Yvain being a good husband and spending time with his wife and following his love and his duty to be a good knight and to always seek adventures and maintain his honor. Christian's writings really changed Arthurian literature forever. And though I only focused on Yvain today, his other works also introduce some of the most memorable aspects of Arthurian legend. Yvain has a lot of similarities to The Lady of the Well, which is one of the tales in the Welsh Mabinogion, which is a collection of 11 tales that were likely written from the 11th to the 14th century. We don't really know the exact dates of these stories. But the Mabinogion is also an Arthurian text that I would like to talk about, as they have three romances in the text that are 
similar to Christian's romances. Though the story beats of the Lady of the Well are very similar to Christian's Yvaine, it follows a very similar plot structure. It is in a completely different setting. All the all three tales that are similar to Christian's stories are in a Welsh setting, and not only that, but they have a different style. Instead of being written in verse like Chrétien, they are written in prose, and they fit in a lot more with Welsh literary tradition than with the continental romance tradition. So there is a lot of debate as to which one originated the other, but in the end, these texts are amazing in their own way and they, even though they have some similarities to Christian's text, they stand on their own and they are also very important parts of the Arthurian legend. The 12th century completely changed Arthurian literature and influenced everything that happened in the centuries after that in the medieval period. From Geoffrey's history introducing Arthur as an actual king of Britain to Chrétien starting the amazing romance tradition that we will see later, the 12th century really changed the game when it came to Arthurian literature and it established this Arthurian expanded universe where other stories could be written and other authors could come in at any place and write an adventure of Tristan or could write an adventure of Sir Gawain and this is what we see in the later centuries and this is what we'll explore in the next part of this series. There are many other texts that were written in the 12th century, for example Marie de France wrote two plays that are set in the Arthurian universe, but these were just some of the most influential texts and these really big hitters in the 12th century that set the stage for everything that was to come. So this wasn't by any means a comprehensive overview of all the Arthurian literature that was written in the 12th century. So we leave the 12th century with our Arthurian expanded universe established, with strong characters and motifs ready to be explored further in the coming centuries. I hope that you enjoyed learning more about Arthurian literature in the 12th century and that you enjoyed this video and I will see you next time.